Assalamu alaikum Sayyidi Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah How does the frequency of the full or super moons affect us energetically? Can it become overwhelming? And if so, how do we manage it? <clears throat> yeah, all, all understanding of, of frequency and energy has an effect. So that, that's a given, obvious. So the amount of energy that's coming through the moon to earth is based on how much it's radiating. So what we call the, the white light, white nights, dark nights. White nights are the first 15. It means that the tajalli is from the birth. So the birth of that tajalli, Allah sending that reality upon the moon and the moon is reflecting. The three nights of full moon then have the most amount of effect on humanity. One is that the general energy and that's why we call people lunatic because of the lunation and the energy from the moon. It affects people's energy, affects their thought processes. If, uh, if too much negativity within them can make them erratic, angry, all sorts of different characteristics if they're subtle and they have a beatific energy then they can receive many, many great tajallis from the moon and its, its emanations that are coming upon insan. It has a tremendous effect upon people as it does the earth. So the moon is able to pull the, the tide of the ocean. The moon is the one that sends a light for vegetation. So things are growing by the energy of moonlight. And the same for ourselves and our soul and our energy reality. So yes, the moon has its significant importance as well as there's a station, there's a awliyas whose station is representing the moon. And the ones whom fast on the white nights where they call the three nights, I believe it's 12, 13, 14th or 13, 14, 15th, I don't know, I think it's 12, 13 and 14, the white nights. There's a station of that reality. The one whom fasts those days and receives the tajalli, that wali in charge of that reality is sending a tajalli to make the person nurani. Allah will take away the sins and the darkness of their sins and exchange it for the brightness of nur and that's His heavenly light. So then there's an immense reality in fasting those days so that at night you'll receive the tajalli, not only the physical reflection of that but that the spiritual reality in which that maqam represents for maqam al-fardani which is the, the highest station of awliya and that reality is a reflection upon the soul so that their souls become very nurani and it dispels any type of darkness and, and badness that they have done to themselves maybe to harm their lights. These are immense blessings for Allah to dress them. In the subject of energy and <coughs> these articles are now coming out that we talked because they're moving towards energy understandings. So when they're studying these voltage they're understanding that there are in Allah's creation animals that have a very strong energy field. And I think the example between a toad and a salamander and they didn't understand why certain creatures if you cut their leg off and their tail immediately the energy of that creature becomes so significantly powerful that it grows its tail back and it grows its arm back. So we know in energy healing as soon as you have a wound, so as soon as you hurt yourself you meditate and become more subtle and meditate, move your hand slowly across somebody who says they are hurting. You feel a, a warmth, a heat because the body has to send an energy to make the person to heal because we're an energy plant, we're an energy being. When there's a damage the body will immediately send the energy to that region 
to begin to replenish like a little factory of neural things coming in and replenishing that area to heal it. So they found in animals now, this was now in January they're coming into their understanding that why certain animals in this creation have a strong energy field, they cut the tail, the arm and they observe it and it starts to grow back over a period of time. And they saw that when the injury took place the energy dropped but immediately that creature and its God-given gift, immediately their energy spiked. So it began to radiate a strong power within itself like its zikr, its meditation and based on the energy vibration and the energy output of the salamander its limbs were growing back. And they're astonished. Okay, so this creature, his energy goes down like everyone else but immediately begins to produce an energy. So I think Harvard is looking into it and they call it the toad and salamander experiment. Then the same scientist said, well the toad doesn't have the ability for that energy. Can we introduce an outside current to that creature and based on the current and a therapy of the current onto that, the toad began to develop an energy onto that leg. Means it was starting a growth pattern within its cellular level because of the stimulation of energy, it was actually starting to grow its leg back. And that's a, a frog that doesn't do that. Means their understanding that energy is what is making us vibrate. Energy is something within ourselves Allah has given to us something very free, it's our own energy. So those who meditate when they have a sickness and their meditations become strong and good they're not only asking from themselves to be healed but they're asking through the madad that can you send an extra energy onto me, they focus on where their wound and where their difficulty is and that that energy begin to flow to them. So they become like a salamander in which their energy becomes so significant and their vibration becomes so significant they can begin their own internal healing process. And they know this from Eastern culture where people have broken bones in Indonesia there are spiritual healers where they have broken bones and, and broken difficulties and they go to these spiritual healers that teach them and they also implement a begin a source of energy upon them. And as a result of the energy healings that they keep going, keep going, keep going, the bone and the damages are healed. And it's not instant but it's over a period of time that because it's already going to heal when they begin to focus energy onto that region the healing is much faster and much more secure means that the tissue damage, the bone damage all of it is re revitalized by energy and nur. So this was an ancient understanding before the advent of, of modern medicine when people became less reliant on themselves and more reliant upon pills and, and other sort of medicines. As a result of that reliance they gave up on themselves. So because of these days that we're entering when Allah is sending these understandings, sending these, these practices, it's advisable continue your medicine no doubt but at the same time that the practice of meditation and then do your practices, make your connection and for those whom are feeling a sickness and a weakness somewhere for example, they would in their meditation they would focus on that region, send the light into that region and ask also for the madad of the outsort, out, outward source that say, you dress your light and focus that light upon me and provide a healing. So this is a, a very real process. So when the shaykhs are in difficulty from different sicknesses then they make their connection with their shaykhs all the way up to the presence of Prophet for the nazar. And for that nazar and that energy that's needed to send that light for a healing and to push away any type of immense difficulty that trying to sort of infiltrate their being. So they live in 
die by that understanding. So these are again the benefits of this energy teachings, energy practices and the ability to heal oneself through on these understandings and at least to speed up recovery. So there's nothing miraculous because the energy and the voltage is there but what they're finding is the stimulation of energies stimulates the whole growth pattern and the recovery pattern and the recovery process. So meditation becomes essential and especially this type of spiritual meditation that we're not connecting just the cosmos but we're actually act, act, asking for a direct reflection from the shaykhs and from the heart of Prophet So it's bringing a directed laser right on to the individual and into their being. So has the immense blessings, immense understandings and, and, and immense openings now are coming back upon the earth, inshaAllah. As Salaamu Alaikum Sayyidi Walaykum As Salaam Is there a way to increase the size of our soul? Not increase the size of the soul because the size is not, is not any relevance. Means Allah will make the size according to what's necessary and the environment that it's in but to increase the vibration and the energy because the soul has no limitation. It's not make my soul big but to make my soul powerful because with that power and when we reach to this ocean of power that resonates in only one place, this, this reality and, and the, the source of this reality is in the heart of Sayyidina Muhammad Anyone saying just Allah they will never reach to this reality. Allah will dress them with other things but whom Allah guides, He guides into the heart of Prophet Only within that heart is a true ocean of power and inside the heart of Muhammadun Rasulullah they find the power of Allah resonating within that reality. So that's why this Muhammadan haqqaiq is so immensely powerful. Many will say, Allah that's okay they reach to whatever Allah want to dress them. But those whom Allah want to give them the supreme gift because it's, it's a gift from the Qur'an, right? So the power of Qur'an is only emanating in one place in the entire created universes and that's into the heart of Sayyidina Muhammad And that's the real tawheed that if you want to find La ilaha illallah it can only be found in the heart of Muhammadun Rasulullah So others may have lots of residue. So the electromagnetic field may be huge but to tap into this power its only way is through the love, the ishq and the, the heart of Sayyidina Muhammad inshaAllah. As Salaamu Alaikum Sayyidi Walaykum As Salaam In regards to the levels of the heart and the color black, is the light of the color actually black or is it just the color of fana? But the color black is a color that means it absorbed every color, right? So in, in our studying of color what you see is what didn't absorb. The reason you see red is that all the other pigments were absorbed and what was left for you to see was red. Black means that all of it has been pushed into the black hole means all the colors have been pulled out, all there is is a blackness. So in that state of akhfa is a state in which they reach into an ocean where everything is black, there is no color. The water of it is black, the atmosphere is black, it's devoid of light. And the Ahlul Bayt at that reality they're all black turbans and black clothes 
because they are the representatives of Prophet ﷺ's faraq that they represent an ocean of, of blackness, that they are the lords of annihilation and that anything that approaches towards them they serve like a… for us to even understand if all… if the heavens are examples of people and the stars are examples of holy souls, the black holes are example of souls that are so powerful that they eat and absorb everything and they annihilate everything and they spit out uh, an immense reality. So anything that approaches a black hole it will disintegrate its reality into a fana. It doesn't mean it, it goes nowhere because it shoots it out into another existence in which it will be revived in baqa. So it's an immense station of smashing into nothing in which Allah brings the servant and to like a dust and enter into a nothingness. Same thing happening on hajj. The symbol of Hajj and the symbol of the Kaaba is that reality, Wahid al-Qahar. The tawaf is an is a ocean of Qahar, ocean of, of crushing, it means all these little white robes they represent like the, the souls that are coming. Then Allah make them in a tawaf and they become tightened in their tawaf. Because sifat the qahar begin to crush them and as a result of crushing them then only one will enter into the black stone. Means that that one soul will be pushed into that reality and annihilated and they see themselves completely annihilated and entered into that ocean of wahid, of oneness of Prophet ﷺ's ishq and muhabbah. So wahid al-qahar means that's the importance of the hajj and the tawaf and spiritual hajj is that Allah bring many and crush them and only one will enter through the black stone and then their soul will be in the ocean of the Kaaba, in the ocean of the representative of the qalb and that's why Allah say, I'm not on heaven, I'm not on earth but I'm on the heart of my believer. And the Kaaba represents the heart of the believer on earth and that's why now the, the believer is very busy and distracted by shopping mall. So that's why only around the Kaaba you see all the shopping malls because the believers are even distracted by dunya. But Allah's not, that's why when you go to Medina represents where Allah's of a energy and there's no shopping mall in Medina. Because that represents a divine presence. But the Kaaba represents the believer. I'm not on heaven, not on earth, but I'm in the heart of my believer. So, it means the station of the Kaaba, it represents the believers. So, when you look around the Kaaba, Allah's showing the dunya is becoming too much, too much of an interest, too, too alluring. As a result, all these huge hotels are filled with malls and shopping centers and every type of buyable and jewelry and all these things, right? These are a distraction for the believer. But Allah's Divinely Presence is Medina to Munawwar and that's why there's no shopping, there's no very little malls. They're trying to put a few stores around but nothing compared to the, the, what they're putting into Mecca. So this is by its nature showing us that the, the reality of that understanding. But to be crushed and to be pushed through that reality is then the station of being uh, crushed to nothingness. The same is happening for the womb because the womb is the haramain. That's why when we look at the haramain, haramain means no haram here. So that represents the womb of a woman. The Kaaba represents the one egg that has to be fertilized and the, the hujaj represent 
what they represent. And we said before 500 million hajis and they make tawaf and the scientists know that the egg chooses which one is coming in, not they choose. So the, the, the hajis that are released into the womb of a woman, they don't choose which one is going into the egg. The command has to come from Allah to the egg and the egg's command will allow that seed that it's been told has to enter. And that's why out of 500 million that are around that one egg, only one seed is allowed in and that's by permission of Allah it's not random. And the scientists now found out and they make diagrams where it shows the egg lets that one seed come in. Otherwise they're all trying to get in, how come they're not all getting in? So by, it's by command of Allah everything is by command, there is nothing else, nothing is random in our creation. So as a result anyone who's been given birth and born into this world was given the gift of life. That 500 million seeds, 4999 million seeds didn't make it, you made it because Allah commanded your seed to enter into that seed and into that egg and to have an existence and come into this world. So it means that you are a gift from Allah your existence is a gift and that that was your first hajj and then you were born and came onto this earth. So alhamdulillah this is an immense, immense gift, our life is a gift from Allah and it's not random, it's not small and you just didn't appear out of nowhere. Every single one was granted an entry into that egg. When they got into that egg Allah gave them their existence and their right to manifest upon this earth inshaAllah. As Salaamu Alaikum Sayyidi Wa Alaikum As Salaam wa So, what is the reality of Joshan Kabir and if we can use it as a ta'weez along with the tariqa ta'weez, how to increase its power if possible? Forgive me for my ignorance. Joshan Kabir. Yeah, all from the Imams of whatever they, they left for us has immense power. So the Joshan Kabir is a recitation and du'as from Sayyidina Musa Qazim and so has an immense blessing. Wherever somebody can find it, recite it from the internet, Joshan Kabir and the, the, the lesser one, minor one means it's a shorter one and then the longer one. Anything from Ahlul Bayt, Imam al Sajjad and his Sajjadiyya and the du'as, all of them have an immense blessing, immense, immense powers and uh, they're quite lengthy. So but the reason we don't propagate that is that it's best to make sure that the tariqah awrad is done before we practice all these other types of du'as and, and etiquettes. So if you have a, a number to recite, it's best that you recite the tariqah recitations always. First consistent that you're so solid with it, not a day is missed by it inshaAllah other than for sickness. When you have that ability then you would go on to others and, and other recitations. And because those are the shaykhs that are alive, the connection to them is already flowing with those big awliya and big Ahlul Bayt and big holy companions, their madad and fayas are upon the shaykhs. So if you do the awrad you already catch that madad and that support, right? But if you did all of what the shaykh asked, you're strong in the connection with the shaykh and you want for tabarak to recite even additionally, no problem has lots of blessings. But if somebody feels, oh no, I'll, I'll leave this and connect with the, the, the big Ahlul Bayt, 
then it comes against the adab because they don't like that and the shaykhs don't like that is keep your connection with your shaykh, it's like an army. You don't say that I'm going to only talk to the general, you fall in rank with the captain or the general or the person that you're, you're in charge with. Even not even a general, these Ahlul Bayt are like the, the admirals and commanders of the entire fleet. So you don't go all the way to the top, you keep an adab and I'll keep into the regiment and the rank in which I'm at. And when I'm strong with that, your commander already communicating with all of them. So it's important to keep the level, keep the adab, keep the respect. When we kept all of those, anything extra is alhamdulillah and not to be get sidetracked into different directions inshaAllah. <coughs> As Salaamu Alaikum Sayyidi Walaikum As Salaam wa rahmatullah. Sayyidi, can you speak more about how the practices invite the body to be tuned behind the scenes by the angels and the jinn? Yeah, the concept of attuning that there's more happening in the world of light than in the world of physicality. When you meditate and you contemplate and you connect, there's a souls and there's bodies. So your body can be very far. So imagine a body is sitting 5,000 miles away from the shaykh. But as soon as you connect with your soul and you're doing your meditation and your contemplation, the souls are gathered right in the vicinity of each other. So the shaykh is continuously orbited, his orbit are his students because their souls are, are attracted to his reality, right? And he's orbiting the reality of his shaykh and his shaykh all the way onto the orbit of the reality of Sayyidina Muhammad So the lights are all together and that's what Prophet described, you be with whom you love. Not your body be with them because people say, oh I'm so far away I'll never be able to see the shaykh. You don't need to. But when you bring your love and your ishq and your heart and sincerity, immediately your soul is connected by the, the attraction of ishq. We said before in talks of love, love is the most powerful magnet, not aqal. You, you don't think about the shaykh and, oh uh, he, he looks like a kind of smart guy, no, no this is about my heart has a love for them, love for Prophet love for Allah the Most Supreme, love for Prophet and love for ulul amr. That love makes my soul always with them and their souls always with their shaykhs. Their shaykhs always with Prophet Prophet surrounded by his Ahlul Bayt, his companions and all the Prophets of Allah So what brings them together is love and that's why the tariqah is based, it has to be based on love. That's why the ulama of aql don't have anything to do with these realities. These are the, the ulama of muhabbat and internal, external they don't have this. They read a book, they don't necessarily believe it, they read it and they have a body to body very far from the reality and from the presence of Prophet If an alam turns to become internal that's something different, different trainings, seclusions, all sorts of different realities or one whom is both, two wings in which is internal knowledge and internal connection, internally been trained and externally a real alam means awliya that his uloom is from beginning to end, not from a book. As a result their souls are continuously in the presence of Prophet and the presence of all awliya, Ahlul Bayt, all the ashiqeen, their souls are radiating together. So then that becomes very powerful. Your soul is picking up every vibration from that shaykh. When you meditate, 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 make that love to be more, your soul is now resonating on his frequency. When you listen to his talks it resonates with you because your soul sitting with him all the time, day and night there's no, there's no night time. So when he's talking and you're hearing a talk 
talking, a lecture and a teaching, it already resonates with your soul. So it burned into the soul that knowledge and that reality. Well that's not something comparable to the physical body and somebody, a student in a classroom listening through his head to a teacher through his head. You may go out and think, I don't know what the guy talked about, I don't even remember anything. But from soul to soul is something completely different. As a result of connecting and connecting and connecting, the soul connection and vibration is most important so that when he speaks, his speech is vibrating deep into your reality, burning into the soul. His zikr is vibrating within the soul. As a result of his practices, vibrate through all the souls that are all around him. So he becomes a nucleus and his students become his electrons. And continuous vibration from his reality keeps his students orbiting around him, what they call juzba, right? So the shaykh becomes the nucleus of their life, the center of their life. As a result they're continuously orbiting because he's also representing Prophet so that's in the nucleus. And Allah is the power most supreme because everybody will watch, well, what happened to Allah? Allah is the most power, Allah is the supreme power of the nucleus. Prophet is the power within that shaykh's heart and then that shaykh's heart becomes the nucleus for the student. And the student's whole life is to make tawaf around that shaykh, keep the focus of the shaykh. Because tawaf we described before is what you focus. If you make tawaf around your car, your own love is your car and your car collection. Uh, what am I going to buy for my car, how am I going to clean my car, everything about a car. So what that which you focus on is what you're making tawaf on. When you focus on the shaykh, you're circumambulating that reality. He speaks, the vibration is coming to you. And what you're hoping in your meditation and your contemplation that from the presence of the nucleus a strong energy has to come out and hit you into the heart. And then that electron can jump a ring and come closer. And the strong voltage comes back out, hits your soul and brings you closer. So it means your practices, your love and your ash and then this voltage begins to hit the heart of the servant and they feel they're coming closer into that love, they have it, they're immersed by that love, they're, they're overwhelmed by that love of Prophet And so then that orbit comes and when they reach close enough to that nucleus and they're receiving the fires of that nucleus, then it's been moved over now to the nucleus of Sayyidina Muhammad Right, because they enter into a nucleus that like a dot but this nucleus keeps expanding. As soon as they got close to the love of the shaykh, this is also the khudur, the fana, the muhabba, that's the same reality but as a circle. And they came, they entered the khudur and in the orbit of the shaykh. The muhabba is bringing them and locking them to that center, they watch the videos, they're, they're mesmerized by the the, the teachings as a result of drawing into that reality. When they came so close into that fana, the shaykh disappears and now it becomes that same nucleus becomes the orbit of Sayyidina Muhammad And again the process expanded now that circle. So again now with the fana of Prophet they come into the immense love of Sayyidina Muhammad and their whole life is how to get the nazar and, and the, the, the nazar and the light of Prophet because now that's the shaykh's life, that the shaykhs are on an orbit and the nucleus is Prophet And everything they're doing is in this ishq and this love is what's making them to orbit. And they're waiting for Prophet to send the light into their heart and draw them nearer. And that light, that energy is what they call when Allah describes that if you want to ascend, come but you need a sultan. Means an authority from the nucleus, the sultan has to send a, a bolt of energy into their soul and that energy 
pulls them even closer into the nucleus of Prophet And that's by the nazar and the good deeds, the actions and motivating all the electrons to come close, come close. That's why our life is about their nazar and, and the, the himma, the zeal in which to do and to do great deeds and, and great actions so that the sultan from the center sends an energy to pull the servant to draw near. This is from the, the micro reality of the soul, not the physicalities. That's why it doesn't matter where the physicalities are located. What matters is what they're doing and the ish they have with their soul. If we understood that then that's why sometimes the physicality can become a handicap. Because the physicality says, oh I see him all the time, I don't know what you're talking about, I don't know he's not like that, I just see him all the time. But the one from afar is trying to connect their soul because their physicality has been limited in drawing near. And that's why the handicap can then reverse the person. Far away they may be sending their soul looking and achieving many realities. And the one in front says, oh well, okay yeah I don't, I don't know about that. So that becomes the difference. So that's why the physicality and the closeness and proximity of physicality has nothing to do with tariqah. It has to do with whom is bringing their soul into that vicinity and how much they're bringing their soul by their deeds and their actions to draw closer, to draw closer, to draw closer with soul closeness, not physical closeness. The soul closeness is then what's receiving all the lights, the emanations and the realities inshaAllah. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzat amma yasifoon wa salaamun al mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa hurmati Muhammad al-Mustafa wa basiri Surat al-Fatiha.